for your evaluations. They were very useful to me. I already sent email to about 50 students, and I had some interesting exchanges with some of you. Many of you are very happy with their recitation instructors. That's great. Many are moderately happy. Maybe that's OK. But there are quite a few who are very unhappy with their recitation instructors. If you are very unhappy with your recitation instructor, you are complete idiots if you stay in that recitation. We have 13 recitation instructors. And I can assure you that it will be very easy to find one that agrees with you. You can come and see me if that helps. Some are better than others. That's the way it goes in life. Some students would like to see more cut and dry problem solving in my lectures. I think that's really the domain of recitations. Lectures and recitations are complementary. In lectures, I prefer to go over the concepts. And I always give numerical examples to support the concepts in a way that's problem solving. And I show demonstrations to further support the concepts, because seeing obviously is believing. I try to make you see through the dumb equations, and admittedly, my methods are sometimes somewhat different from what you're used to here at MIT. I try to inspire you, and at times, I try to make you wonder and think. And I want to keep it that way. I believe that hardcore problem, problem solving is really the domain of the recitations. Many of you found the exam too easy, and many of you found the exam too hard. Some complained it was too hard because it was too easy. <laughs> Quite ironic, isn't it? They say, we want more math. We want more standard problems. Look, who wants more math? I'm teaching physics. I test you physics. I don't test your math abilities. If you digest the homework, and that's very important that you make the homework part of your culture. That you study the solutions. The solutions that we put on the web today, 415, solution to number four will go on the web. Believe me, they are truly excellent solutions, not cut and dry. They give you a lot of background. If you digest those solutions, then the concepts will sink in. And now, at your 50-minute test, do you really want problems? which are complicated math? Clearly not. I could try that during next exam, but then I may have to buy myself a bulletproof vest to be safe. Concepts is what matters. When I gave my exam review here, I highlighted the concept. Each little problem that I did, I did here was extremely simple. Conceptually, they were not so simple but from a math point of view, trivial. Clearly, I cannot cover all the subjects in a 50-minute exam. I have to make a choice. So your preferred topic may not be there. Some of you think that the pace of this course is too slow. Some of you think it's too fast. The score, the average score, was 3.8. 4.0 would have been ideal. What do you want me to do? I can't accommodate all of you, those who think it's too slow, and those who think it's too fast. 3.8 is close enough to ideal for me, 4.0. And so I'll have to leave it the way it is. Besides that, keep in mind, you are now at MIT. You're no longer in high school. Now the good news. There were quite a few students who said the homework is too long. Not a single person said it was too short. <laughs> I can fix that. I will reduce all future assignments by about 25%, effective tomorrow. I have already taken off assignment number five, two problems. You're down now to seven. And I will do that, all assignments that are coming up. <laughs> My pleasure. Today, I'm going to cover with you something 
that conceptually is the most difficult of all of 802. And you will need time to digest it. And if you think that what you're going to see is crazy, then you're not alone. The only good news is that conceptually it's not going to become more difficult. Remember that Erstedt in 1819 discovered that a steady current produces a steady magnetic field and that connected electricity with magnetism. A little later, Faraday therefore suggested that maybe a steady magnetic field produces a steady current. And he did many experiments to show that. It turned out not to be so. And one way he tried that is as followed. He had here a battery with a switch, and here he had a solenoid. He closes the switch, a current will flow, and that creates a magnetic field in the solenoid. And that magnetic field, maybe it runs like so. Depends on the direction of the current. And so now, he put around this solenoid a loop. Let's call this loop number two. That was around the solenoid. And let's call this loop number one, of which the solenoid is part. Whenever there was a current in number one, he never managed to see a current in number two. If there is a current going in number one, there is a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is seen, of course, by the conductor number two, by that loop. Never any current. And so he concluded that a steady magnetic field, as produced by the solenoid, circuit one, does not produce a steady current in number two. But then one day, he noticed that as he closed the switch, he saw a current in number two. And when he opened the switch, again he saw a current in number two. And therefore he now concluded that a changing magnetic field is causing a current. Not a steady magnetic field, but a changing magnetic field. And this was a profound discovery which changed our world and it contributed largely to the technological revolution of the late 19th and early 20th century. A current, therefore an electric field, can be produced by a changing magnetic field. And that phenomenon is called electromagnetic induction. And that phenomenon runs our economy, as you will see in the next few lectures.